So, Dr. Nukowski, thank you so much for being here. Sure. And yeah, so I've um, kind of played down the slides, so I hope that there's room to keep it interactive and discussion and as questions come up or specific situations to you that uh, you're having trouble sleeping with, maybe we can kind of be your soundboard and hopefully maybe provide some suggestions. Everything I cover today is going to be behavioral intervention, so non-drug interventions. Um, that's primarily what I've focused on um, for the past 10 years through my training um, in, in the terms of kind of behavioral health and, and what we can do to, to help that. So yeah, today I've been studying insomnia and sleep disorders for probably about 15 years. I started as a um, PSG tech where I, we actually like hooked up all the little electrodes to like measure people's brain waves and, and, and do that um, and just kind of came up the ranks and I've always stayed interested in it just because it hits, we could see from this room, it hits so many people. Even if you don't think you have insomnia, most of us at least could own up to at least like one night here or there of I had to catch this flight, you know, this was going on, and it just threw your sleep out of whack, and you don't feel great the next day. So I think almost anybody could probably benefit from, from some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, and then research-wise, it's just very interesting. Welcome to Unified Conferencing. Because it just overlaps with, uh, what mean? Um, it overlaps with, all these other disorders that um, potentially, so that seems to be the, the way the research is moving now. So um, for instance, looking at uh, relationships to obesity and um, leptin and ghrelin and some of these hormones and how sh shorter sleep can actually impact our uh, obesity, immune functioning. It's, it's moving in all kinds of different directions that we're finding that sleep is really just as critical to your health as you would treat other things, as you know, your diet, your exercise, um, and we should kind of give it the same amount of um, care about it and focus. So the talk today is, um, just to give you an overview, sleep di disturbance versus insomnia and kind of subtle differences between somebody that's just reporting they're having sleep versus if they would actually meet criteria for it to be insomnia. Um, we'll cover the um, empirically supported insomnia treatment um, that's a behavioral treatment called cog cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It's been well uh, validated for probably over 30 years in all kinds of populations, cancer, chronic pain. Um, we can see about an 80% improvement in most people. So it's, got, it's fairly effective to, to help people. Um, then I'm going to break that down based on some of the treatment guidelines. I'm not going to give you the full package, but I'm going to give you like helpful tips that I think you can take away today and maybe try to implement into your own lives and see if that works. And if you still feel like you need more beyond that, I'm going to give you my information and then some other resources as well. And you can kind of pick and choose what you feel would be most helpful for you to um, address if you feel the sleep has been an issue for you. So um, we're going to start with um, insomnia epidemiology. So basically it kind of just goes down. So as I said, it's, it's pretty highly prevalent that people will report some problems in sleep. So insomnia symptoms are just like anything, like oh, I had trouble falling asleep or staying asleep last night. It could be anywhere from 30 to, you know, one out of two people could be reporting that on any given basis. If you're reporting that it's happening more often or always, that's the numbers are going to go down a little bit to 16 to 21 um, percent. Moderate to extreme goes down again a little bit. And as we um, kind of stringent up our criteria and include daytime symptoms and daytime consequences, so beyond, oh, I had a bad night last night, but now it's bled into my next day that I can't concentrate, that I'm feeling fatigued or irritable or, you know, any of the, the ways that it, it affects you, maybe even just feeling fatigued and low energy. Um, that gets down to about 9 to 15 percent would meet that. Um, and then to get a true diagnosis, um, the DSM-5 diagnosis now is you have to, it has to go on kind of chronically for a period of three months. Um, so on, I'd say, three or four nights a week for, for that period. And, and so then it, it kind of dwindles down. So maybe about 10% of the population are actually people that probably should be coming into my office. But, but you can see there's a whole range of people that 
probably could use some tips of ways to improve it. And if we could get these people, I've been thinking about this a lot. What, what we've been doing is an intervention for people that already have the diagnosis. But what about giving education to people that might be up here, not fully meeting it? Uh, and can we give you guys the education to improve your sleep so it won't get so bad that it, it's years and years and years? So, so um, this is uh, what DSM-5 is kind of our diagnostic and statistical manual. It's kind of our coding Bible for all different disorders, and so um, along with ICD. So in here, basically the diagnosis is difficulty falling asleep. Like you're, you get into bed, you just can't fall asleep. You lie there for an hour or two hours. You might be watching TV for a while, shut it off, attempt, and you're still not able to sleep. Uh, that would be falling asleep. Maintaining sleep is after you've fallen asleep at least once, then you're, for whatever reason, having uh, waking up in the middle of the night. So that could be hot flashes for some people, uh, uh, having to urinate for others, maybe pain, maybe no reason at all, and you just kind of pop up. It kind of, the more you learn about sleep, it, it comes in these waves and sections. So uh, we all have brief awakenings, just most people don't remember them. So. That would seem like, oh, I didn't know why I woke up. I just kind of popped up. And for some people, it extends on. So that's the maintaining, that they're, um, you're waking up in the middle of the night and then having trouble falling back to sleep. It could be having, were you raising your hand? You have a question? No, I'm sorry. I just put my jacket on. Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> and feel free, pepper me with questions. I think it makes it more interesting. So, so um, they could have you know, one awakening and it could last two hours or they just couldn't get back to sleep versus somebody else might have three, four awakenings due to different causes and up for 20, 30 minutes and it's kind of spreckled throughout. None of them feel good. You'd rather have that deep, solid, condensed sleep of, even if it had to be shorter, that it would just be kind of one chunk rather than all these awakenings. And then early morning awakening usually means that um, you're awakening earlier than you intend to, so you want to get up at six. You pop up at four, and then you just can't get back to sleep after that. And that one is pretty problematic and frustrating for people because most people aren't up yet. You know, the house is, the bed is warm. You don't want to get out of bed. You really, you would really prefer to be sleeping till six, but yet you're just lying there frustrated and bad. So, question over here. yes. What's the minimal amount of hours for like over forty? Um, the minimum, so they actually just came out with a new poll and, and new numbers. And so we're really pushing, the sleep field's really pushing that it's not based on a concrete number, that it's based on a range. So if you're a bit younger, in 40s, I would say it's seven to nine hours. And we don't know if people are at seven or nine, um, but somewhere in that range is probably where most mid-age people fall, you know, adults. As we start to age a little bit and maybe get to a little bit of the older adult side, they've actually kind of changed their guidelines rather than being seven to nine, they recommend seven to eight now. They think that as we age, we just might need, so there's a couple things that could be going on with aging. Like if you biologically need just a little bit less, but you're still stretching your sleep out and trying to get what you thought you got when you were 20 and I could sleep nine or 10 hours, it's not gonna work very well. So. Um, trying to pull your street and stretch it out. It, it, it's, if you're limited, I think of it like a bank. If you're limited to a finite amount of hours and you're you know, like trying to kind of burn the, the stick at both ends, you know, burn the candle, you can only get so far, right? So like seven is about the minimal. Seven is <coughs> minimal for being able to, there's some kind of aberrant people that, that can function on less. That field is stu still new and hot and trying to figure out like these, peop these people that sleep six hours but feel refreshed what's going on there. But for the average person, I would say seven would be a good way to go, so. Okay, so now I just wanna touch really quickly on insomnia versus sleep deprivation because we can get the two mixed up and somebody could come <coughs> into my office uh, and kind of be in the wrong category. So we see here we have insomnia or sleep deprivation are two kind of things that could be going on with us. And then we have sleep opportunity and sleep ability. So somebody that has um, insomnia has um, adequate sleep opportunity 
but they have reduced sleep ability. So what that means is they're usually giving themselves beyond seven hours, eight, nine hours. If they're having trouble, they might add on more. They might add on more by taking naps, extending out your, your rise time in the morning. So you're beyond, you're spending a, a chunk of time in bed. So the opportunity is not lacking. What's lacking is the ability to sleep. You lie there frustrated in bed, not able to sleep or you know wherever you are. Um, and just people report it as feeling kind of tired but wired. Like you're tired and you want, you wish it and will it and want it to sleep, it's just not coming and what's going on. As opposed to somebody that's sleep de deprived, which might be if you're trying to get to the minimum and find out how little you have and you're like pushing it to six hours, you'll kind of know because you start feeling this way. So you're in sleep deprivation, your sleep oppor opportunity is reduced. You're not giving your body that chance even if it could but the ability is still adequate, like you would be able to. So in that case, usually somebody presents to my office what they look like is, oh, I'm just so tired, you know, I, even in the day, if I shut off this light right now and, you know, kind of played soft music, how many people could fall asleep? Usually people with true insomnia can't. If they can't sleep at night, they're not gonna sleep in the day, you know, they, they feel that tired but wired kind of thing going on, as opposed to somebody that's sleep deprived does feel that sleepiness, like you're not getting enough and you're just kind of, you know, so I think that's my next slide too, talking about sleepiness versus fatigue, which they're two different things, so, yes. So sleepiness is really this biological need, the likelihood of falling asleep. So if I did shut off this light, what are the chances any one of you would be able to fall asleep? Now it's earlier in the morning, we just got up, you know, we're all socializing, so it might be, but, um, or if you're a passenger in the car for an hour, what is the likelihood you would fall asleep in that situation? Or at the theater, what would be the likelihood you would fall asleep in that situation? If you can fall asleep in those kinds of situations, um, kind of inadvertently doze off, um, that's sleepiness. That's when you're actually, you're able to sleep. The fatigue is really a different condition um, and it doesn't include sleepiness. It's more of like weariness, um, dif increased difficulty sustaining a high level of performance, the role of stress and emotional stress, uh, negative mood. Fatigue kind of encompasses, it could be mental, it could be physical, your body's just kind of worn, but they're not the same thing. So often with insomnia, we'll see the fatigue more than the sleepiness. And if there is sleepiness, to me, that means something else might be going on either. Other sleep disorders like sleep apnea cause sleepiness, um, reducing the opportunity causes sleepiness. Um, we want to get you there and through treatment, through the treatment I do with, with cognitive behavioral therapy, this is kind of our goal to get you truly feeling sleepy and not fatigued because that's going to kind of get you over the hump to be sleeping better. Okay, so now we're going to get into many um, causes of insomnia. So there's um, it can be just about anything you can think of. That's why so many people have even seeing this talk were like popping up like, oh, this is going on with me or this is going on with me. And it's like, yeah, those things are stressful. Stress does not go well with the bed and the bedroom and sleep. Like they just don't, they're not compatible. So, so some of the things I have here are, um, it's just a city that never sleeps, right? Like, and, and same in our own homes. Like we could, there's always something to do if we really want it now with, with um, TV and internet and you know, surfing the web. Somebody's always up somewhere around the country that we can be chatting with or blogging with or whatever. So, um, so I, I find it that that can be um, problematic. Um, you know, it could be anything. It could be kids disturbing your sleep. It could be you um, kind of thinking about the, the stress of the job the next day and what you have to get done and you're just behind. <coughs> it's, it's the anticipatory, anticipatory stress before you catch a flight, an early morning flight, right? You're like, I'm gonna miss it, I'm gonna miss it. And then you're not sleeping for hours. And so these are the acute things that bring it on. This doesn't necessarily bring on insomnia, but it's bringing on the disturbed sleep that night then other things kind of perpetuate the insomnia. You know, pain in yourself could do it, or things with your bed partner, if you have a loud bed partner or a pet that's um, <laughs> disrupting your sleep, it's all chipping away and diminishing at the quality of your sleep. 
So these are kind of what we consider the acute stressors that will bring it on. And some consequences of it, um, I mean, you can imagine that. Yes? I found that for me, caffeine and some medication cause insomnia. Ca oh, caffeine and medication. Yes, definitely. They're definitely uh, different kinds. Of, you have to be very, in fact, we are as providers all the time of like thinking about which ones are stimulant, you know, causing that level. For, and when you take it then, like I should be taking this in the morning versus this at night. Yeah. Is insomnia more prevalent in females than males? It runs... It's kind of a mixed bag. It runs about the same um, when we look at objective polysomnography. Um, but women tend to report it more. And then women, when they go through these hormonal periods of change, then that increases it usually during, during those times. But for the most part, yeah, about 15% of the population is what we say. Yeah, so the comment was, do men or women experience insomnia worse. And I would say n neither one experiences it worse, at least objectively, at what we look at. Um, but uh, the, the caveat being like times of, of reproductive hormonal change in women's life tend to escalate insomnia. So the prevalence number might look up. But neither case is worse than the other either. So. Um, so yeah, so consequences, I mean, anything you can really think of in your own lives that, you know, I can think of things of just feeling really tired and run down and not wanting to do something. I may skip something. So that's a consequence of, you know, having a bad night. Um, getting into arguments with the spouse or just feeling irritable, you know, road rage or when you're on your road, that's a stressful time. So um, you might and under normal circumstance, if you got a better night's sleep, you might not feel this way, but um, after a bad night, something like this could happen. Um, oftentimes, your mood, either anxiety or, you know, kind of a, a low, depressed mood can, um, if you have a, a long enough period of having trouble sleeping, it can kind of get to you, and it's, it, they work off of some of the same neurotransmitters, so, um, so just not good that then they can be interlinked. The good thing is there's been a lot more studies to show that this therapy I'm about to bring up to you guys, the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, it actually has shown to have benefic beneficial effects for mood too. So, um, so that's good. Um, yeah, and just kind of feeling malaise, not get, feeling like you're not getting your work done and everything's slow, sometimes cognitive, you know, issue, you just feel fuzzy brain. So here's kind of our model, what we work from. So the pre-morbid is just anything you can think of that's kind of like a genetic predisposition. So um, <coughs> genetically, you, maybe you had a family member that also had insomnia or to have struggled with sleep or um, kind of this hyperarousal feeling too that was passed down to you. Your family was anxious, you know, um, and you feel that same way. That's kind of the pre-morbid genetic stuff. As we move on to the precipitating, so that builds its little block throughout. That won't go away. We don't look to change that. Um, the acute um, insomnia precipitating factors are the things we just discussed in that last slide. So it could be I have to catch a flight. It could be my kids are stressing me out. My husband's stressing me out. Work's stressing me out. Those are the things that are bringing on acutely what's going on with your sleep, bringing, you know, <coughs> messing it up. Um, but that won't stay high forever for most of us. It could be for a bit if you're caring for like an aging parent or someone that's ill, but, but eventually this line will, will go down. It doesn't stay peak forever for the rest of your life. So then what is, what's responsible when the stressor goes away that we still can't sleep after that? So we call those the perpetuating factors, things that are continuing to make it go on. Um, despite once this goes, so if this is our line for insomnia threshold, it cuts back down with the acute stuff, but this is keeping it over. So, um, so some the things we like to, are actually the, the targets of treatment, and we're gonna get into in the next couple of slides of things that people do that perpetuate the insomnia. Because really what happens is I don't think people, my job is really easy explaining this. Like, uh, 
we know what we know really works is to kind of shorten and condense sleep and get people sleeping better quality sleep, not worrying about quantity as much at first. But that's kind of scary to think about if you're already having trouble sleeping that I'm going to reduce my sleep at all. So what people mostly do, the knee-jerk reaction is, let me try to catch up some way. You know, let me either take a nap, let me sleep in, and it just kind of spins out of control. So it's those behaviors as well as then any freak out panic thoughts we have about it. Like, oh no, you know, my body's taken over, I have no control over it. This must be kind of a neurotransmitter thing going on and I can't do anything about it and I'm stuck prisoner in this body that's failing me. So those are kind of the reactions you get as, as it goes on, you know, week after week. I had a patient that he took a flight to Asia and then those time zones were just what set him off and then he got back and he panicked and then after that it was a mess for months, you know, so then he met with me and we got it straightened out, but yeah. So some of the very specific unhelpful behaviors that I'm talking about that people tend to do are things like um, going to bed, either going to bed at a, a certain time because you feel it's that way, like, oh, it's 10, 15, I have to get into bed because I, I need eight hours, you know, so, but you're not feeling sleepy yet, you know, so you're just getting into bed doing that. Um, and then just staying there awake, you know, once you get into bed, okay, I'm committed, I'm, you know, I'm here. And, uh, that's not great. Um, doing other activities in bed is, is not helpful. So if I can't sleep, I'm just going to pull out a book or, you know, and read from bed. At least that's relaxing and taking my mind off my worry about the sleep. And we'll talk about it. Not a bad strategy. It's just the way he's doing it. Also, you notice the light emitting from. And so now there's, and I'm guilty of this. I do read my iPad from bed. Um, I dim the light a lot and I'm hoping that'll help, but there's more and more research showing that let's put down the iPads and the devices and actually look at real books instead and, and that might be a little bit better. The, the light is very sensitive for, so at night we have a hormone called melatonin that kicks in and it kicks in with the dark. So if you have artificial light emitting, it's still so new to us that we're not sure how much it's impacting people sleep but your kind of your biological rhythm melatonin should kick in at night so so just be weary of this right now I'm waiting for the the data to be out and all I do is lower my screen to like half so it's kind of dim or I've heard people can flip the text so it's white on black rather than black on white page so there's less white and it's more a black page with white words on it and that's a lot less light too so so those are some options Sleeping in late is no-no for, uh, for what I'm about to describe to you. Um, napping during the day is something that people would do to compensate for a bad night. And then just kind of staying in bed frustrated. So this is typically what I see before people talk to me about what they're doing. Not really doing much except uh, a lot of people I guess are focused on that night of like I just need to make it through that next day and in my mind the therapy I do is not about, it's never about tonight. Yeah, you had a crappy night, we're gonna roll with it. We're gonna try to get it better tomorrow night. So that's kind of my shift of framework of like how I'm thinking about things. Any thoughts or examples of behaviors or anything before we move on that people wanna share? Yeah? What about when you wake up at the same time every night and by the same time, 3.02 a.m., not 2.58 one night, 3.01, it's 3.02 every night. Yeah. I mean, I've got that. Yeah, that's very How interesting. That <laughs> uh, it's curious that it's so hardcore, like a, a very specific, very interesting. Our bodies are, very, everything I do to this behavioral work, our bodies are very biological and behavioral based. So certain things your body will get used to, and so I'll talk about it in the context of some of the recommendations I'm gonna make, but so say for one of them, I'll give you a, a tip ahead of time, is to like get up at the same time every day. Your body learns to depend on that and then can kind of model its sleep around that, making it easier to get up at that time. So something's happening there with you that it's, you know, like it's just, that's the right time for it to happen. What uh, do you go to the bathroom or do you know what the cause, or does it just pop up? It just pops up. I, I, I wake up and it's 3.02 a.m. 
So the other thing I would recommend to you, and we're going to get into it, is turn around the clock. The clock can cause a lot of stress for people. Just that alone, I've heard people tell me, like, this is great, you know, like I don't. Then you wouldn't know if you have a feeling like, oh, it feels like it's around three, you know. But you wouldn't necessarily know. When you get down to the finite, your brain is working too hard at a point where it should be blah, you know, right? So um, we don't want that to happen. And one way to avoid that is to turn around the clock, so. Well, and I typically try to do that, but then, um if it's close to when my alarm is going to go off and I fall back to sleep, then my alarm will go off and it's hard for me to wake back up. So that's the, that's the reason I'll look at my clock. So how close you, to yeah, it. so you fall, you're like, okay, so it's three, took you a while to go back to sleep, and then you make it and you have to be up in an hour. And the, at that point you're feeling like, oh, it's too, because what you're doing is what, the goal of our therapy is, is turn around the clock, don't pay any attention to it, set it for the time that you want it to, what you, time you have to get up, and if it hasn't rung, you're not looking at it ever, but you're doing everything in your power in the spirit of sleep, relaxing, calming, it doesn't matter. Um, if it's during daytime, then you're doing everything in your power to follow through with what you're supposed to do. So if we set a regular set scheduled morning time and, you know, go for a walk in the morning or something, then, then do those things and to keep yourself alert at that point. Most of us, we, what you're describing too is if you fall back asleep and then you had a chunk where you weren't sleeping, you're going to feel like you didn't have enough then. You're wanting to extend out a little bit, but you have to fight that. This is very short term, let me tell you. Uh, therapy, there's a dose response study that said it can be done in four weeks. I find for more complicated cases, it's six weeks. I usually meet with people for 50 minutes. Um, but think about that, like a month or two months of kind of changing your behavioral habits and your program of like, Oh uh, yeah, then I even, if I do that, th this leads to this and I feel like crap. We, we call that sleep inertia. It still goes on for all of us when you first get up. But have your feet hit the floor, stand up, do a yawn and a stretch, you know, maybe even like that cup of coffee. Give it that first 5, 10, 15 minutes and tell me if you're still as sleepy as you were. And that'll just kind of get you through it. We have tips to just try to get you through things as they're diff the therapy's not perfectly easy, but as we, you know, we work with you with any problems you come up, like if that was a big problem, we'd come in and have several like worksheets we could work to figure it out for you. So, um, so there are ways to, to get around those things. So, okay, so that's the behaviors. Um, the unhelpful thoughts um, could really be anything. A common one I hear is people rehearsing lists in their head. I have this, this, this to do tomorrow, usually, you know, I'm planning for the next day of like, or it's just weighing on me, like I have this looming deadline, I have two looming deadlines, how am I going to navigate that, I only have so much time, they may not be tomorrow, they may be a couple weeks down the road, but it's wearing on me now and probably will wear on me for the next two weeks until they go out. Um, this picture of the baby is just to show people have Sometimes they have um, unrealistic expectations with their sleep. I already told you that as we sleep and age, we tend to need a little bit less than we, we would have needed at, at a, as baby time, surely, even in our 20s. Um, so thinking about times, thinking back to when it was great, and I had somebody tell me, oh, I just want to sleep like a baby in my mother's arms. And it's like, okay, is that a great goal? Or are you or setting yourself up for some failure? Because how about if we got it feeling you know, 80% better, 50% better, and we'll uh, go from there and see how you feel, how your energy feels in that. So just kind of re recognizing and checking your expectations. I have to get eight hours every night or the world's going to fall apart. You know, I'm not going to be able to work. I'm not going to be able to do that. That's another common one, which we all know. Yeah, eight hours isn't some magic number. So it's really dispelling myths that we tell ourselves that make us more anxious about out sleep. Um, just a whirlwind of everything going on as a mom or someone else of like this, this, this. Just too many things <laughs> thinking. So, um, so that can be unhelpful when she's got all this stuff floating around. She cannot shut off her brain. I want to sleep but, but my brain won't stop talking to itself and this is what it's telling her like you got all this stuff going on in the day. You can't, you can't use this time to sleep. 
you just have to sit here and worry. So um, worry about like, I'm worrying specifically about sleep too. So some of these worries of I got this to do, they're not like sleep related worries. Um, some of them, if I don't get eight hours sleep, you know, I'm going to get a poor evaluation at work. I'm going to get fired. This is, you know, you'll run down the line of like what could be the worst case scenario. Or, yeah, I'm just not going to be productive. You know, I'm not going to get anything done. They're going to notice. It's going to be a disaster. So sleep-related consequences onto how your life is. And so that's no good either. So if they're sleep-related or other related, we can deal with, with all that. But these are the things that contribute to the sleep disturbance the two big things. So it's not surprising then that our treatment is called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia because if we have the thoughts, we have the behaviors, those are the things we're going to work on. Those were the perpetuating factors. So for the behaviors, it's a set of instructions for changing sleep-related behaviors that are incongruent with good sleep. And in cognitions, we address sleep-related thoughts that interfere with good sleep, that compromise adherence to the behavioral treatment recommendations, and to reduce suffering, uh, improve hope, realistic expectations, and the acceptance of, of it. So um, we have a couple specific pieces in the behavioral. We call them um, sleep restriction and stimulus control. Those are our main behavior <coughs> ones. And then we have some related to cognitions. And I'm going to get into some of it today and tips kind of broken down a little bit easier that I think you guys can apply to your life. So this is, I just wanted to give you one slide of data to show that, that what I do works. Uh, we have over 30 years of data collection on this intervention. Um, this one was published by JAMA in 1999. Uh, the white line is placebo. The yellow line is um, temazepam, which is Restorel, uh, a sleep aid. We have uh, pink is a combined of both the temazepam and CBT, and then the, the red one is the CBT, CBTI that we do. So on this line, we have minutes wake after sleep onset. So how much are you awake in the middle of the night? So if you think about it, naturally you want that number to be as low as possible. You don't want to be awake at all. You prefer it to be zero. Um, and in fact, our benchmark, research benchmark is usually about 30. 30 or under is, you know, good. And if it's over 30, we're considering you kind of a poor sleeper. So our placebo probably started around there, you know, like over 60, had a little bit of a placebo effect at post-treatment, felt like they were getting a little bit better. Then, you know, you're just being followed, followed at three months, followed 12 months, followed for two years. It kind of went back up and just stayed. Um, the drug, they, at, so at, at post-treatment, they all worked equally well. So you could do any of them kind of and you could take drug or you could do this behavioral stuff and it would work equally well. The problem we run into is as we move out to three month, 12 month, 24 month, the line starts spreading and we see a bigger gap. So that how it shakes out is the one with drug goes back up almost to where it began at 50 minutes when we're two years out. So, um, so not very helpful in the long term of helping your sleep. Where, is that because your body becomes used to that particular sleep medication? Your bodies can adapt to it uh, and then need more medication sometimes. Uh, there's a lot of things going on with it. And they haven't, most drug trials haven't done safety trials for, there's a couple out there that have, but a lot of them have not done two year safety trials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just don't usually anticipate people are going to be taking that that long. They really created it for the person that is, I have jet lag, I'm flying, I have this going on in my life before surgery, you know, like let me give you something to relax and help you sleep. And that's acute. So they think most people will take it two to four weeks, get over the hump, and that's it. They didn't really think about people that have chronic insomnia or, yeah, something that just keeps going and their sleep is off, you know, um, and what that does. So, yeah, so. Um, so that's why, in the, in the long run, the behavioral stuff works better. Yeah? yeah. I have a question. Uh, what, what do you mean by placebo? What do you use as placebo? Or is that good? The longer period that you are not awake, 
between zero to 60 minutes, is that good or, I, I, I didn't quite <coughs> get it. Uh, so okay, so this. What, what is the purpose? Yeah, this is how much they're awake in the middle of the oh, night. Awake. Awake, so you'd want it to be low, okay. as low as possible, because you don't want to be awake in the middle of the night. Okay. Uh, and the white placebo, presumably, I'd have to look back at this study, was just a pill to sh from the difference of the oh. temazepam. So each would be a pill. You just didn't know what you were getting. So, Thank yeah. And then there was a combined group, too, but, which is interesting. It, it landed somewhere in between that... Um, was more effective than drug, but less <coughs> effective than. So even that combined didn't do as well as just pure CBT alone. So presumably, I mean, I can hypothesize, y you'll learn some today, and if you came to like a, a BSM specialist, they teach you all the skills, and the last session is like, how can we prevent this from happening again? So if you have behavioral skills, it makes sense that you can just pull them in any time, and you don't even have to go back to another doctor or maybe you would for a boost up, booster session, but um, so yeah, so that's, so now I'm gonna get right to the um, tips that are helping you guys, because I think this is what you wanted to see, so. Yes? Does changing the medication help you sleep better? In other words, I've been taking temazepam. Okay for about two years, and it is not as effective. Mm -hmm. Then I started something else, and it's not working either. Mm. So we're increasing, the doctor is increasing the dosage, and I'm wondering, is that the normal thing to change medication when it's not working? Is it, are they? Yeah, well, I'm not a physician, I'm a, a PhD. But I can tell you that's what I've seen a lot in, in practice, is that if things don't work, they try it for a course. They want to make sure you're on it long enough to see, you know, yeah, you can change with doses, change medications, and, and try different approaches to see if there's something that is going to work for you. So I, it's not unheard of that they would do it that way. Um. Ultimately, their goal is to get you, I guess, improve quality of life, to get your s sleeping better and having it go away. So they're just looking to, to find that for you. Um, so my first rule, so now I'm just going to go through rules with you that I think could be helpful for you. So, um, so rule number one is go to bed when sleepy. So I, and I say this, but I uh, don't want... So what I don't want is you to go to bed because it's a certain time, like 10 o'clock is the time I normally go to bed. If anything, if you're not feeling tired, you shouldn't be laying there awake. The, the goal of almost all of this is to reduce any time you're spending in bed awake. We don't want you to be there laying awake. So if you naturally go when you're feeling more tired and even push yourself to, to wait till you're feeling sleepy and then go, even if everybody else is asleep, then um, you have more likely chance that you're going to be able to fall asleep. So again, remember, everything I'm going to tell you is not really about tonight either, because so, it might be reducing your sleep, which we want, because what we know about sleep is if we build something called homeostatic pressure or sleep effort, it's going to work well. That sleep pressure will get you feeling tired the next night. So if we reduce and kind of shrink and kind of artificially sleep deprive you on this night by do, doing things like this of, okay, I didn't go to bed till sleepy, and it was 1 a.m., then that's fine. That's fine for tonight. You're going to probably feel like crap tonight, but it's, you're going to get a much better sleep tomorrow night. You know, so, so never really think about, like, the single night. And, in fact, when I do it in treatment, I actually think about the week. We look across the average because everybody could have a variation. So, so yeah, so how do you know you're sleepy? I found mostly pictures that are, like, cute puppies and kids because they show overt signs. So rubbing your eyes, yawning, you know, it's just that feeling of drifting, you know, like you feel like you could sleep. It's hard to describe, but people that have true insomnia sometimes come and tell me that they, they don't um, know that. They don't know that feeling, that they just feel tired, but, but their brain is working and never feel this way. After a week of treatment with me, they usually start to feel tired, so, because that's what the therapy is designed to do, so. 
And, and going to sleep when sleepy, you're meaning actually at night, not like at night. right now. Not now. <laughs> not, not that you have anything to do with sleeping. <laughs> no, yeah, not in general. We'll talk about naps, but uh, generally, no. Um, Avoid other activities in bed other than sleep and sex are the, the only two. Um, so that could be anything. If we're watching TV in bed, the iPads, phones, even reading books, anything you're doing in your room, your room should kind of become a sanctuary of not doing much. And it, so this is all based on this principle of like classical conditioning and behavioral theory learning of if you pair something with something else it can cause like a reaction so so if we pair the bed in the bedroom and you're awake you're doing other things you might be frustrated about your sleep every time you go in there whether you know it or not you're kind of like oh, is it going to be another night is it going to play like it did last night and that's no good what we want it to be is just to walk in there like Finally, right? Like I get away from my whole day and you know, here's the spot and you know, it's gonna feel great. So, so we want to get you there and how we do that is to get rid of anything else going on in it and really try to keep the bed, you're reprogramming your body if you only spend time that you're in bed asleep. If you're not, you're somewhere else. So that brings me to the next. So don't stay awake in bed. So. So either in the beginning, you're, you're waiting till you feel sleepy to go to bed at, in the beginning of the night, and then if you find you can't sleep either at that point or you're popping up in the middle of the night, I ask that you don't lie there. It, it'd be best if you actually get out of bed, you know, create yourself a nook somewhere else, um, set up 10 movies that you wanna watch, whatever's relaxing and, and non-striving, non-stimulating, relaxing enough that it's gonna help you drift back off to sleep, not a page turner. Uh, not work either, like I'm not going to go fold all the laundry or anything like that. So do something that's rewarding and relaxing to you to get you out of bed at 2 a.m. because it's not fun. Um, I've done it myself at times that I just pull this one in. If I'm not asleep, I'm not just going to lay there and torture myself. So, so get up. Some people do this, but they are reading in bed, but that's the mistake because you're following the old conditioning pattern of doing other things in bed. So really, it needs to be in a separate room. And then the other key piece, so that's going to break the conditioning and how your body relearns the, the bed is a wonderful place kind of feeling is that you um, go return to sleep when you're feeling sleepy. Like, how do I know when I'm feeling sleepy? Not looking at a clock. You know, it's not based on any of that. We shouldn't know. Um, it's just how your body feels. Trust in your body. Your body gives you what you need. So. So that's that. So even if you're out of there a couple hours, and you just keep repeating this if it happens again. I prefer people not to repeat it too much, like just challenge yourself and stay up till you truly feel sleepy, and then go to bed uh, and be doing these things. Whatever's relaxing to you, I just put a couple that would be good for me. And don't be doing this, whatever's going on. How do you know when to get up? I say 15, 20 minute rule of being there like this. If you're not looking at a clock, if you think it's been 15, 20 minutes, or you feel like um, I, you know, you're having any thoughts in your head, like, I wonder if it's been that, you know, that's your time. Like, as soon as you start having conversations in your head, it's time to get up. So We talked about don't watch the clock a lot already. This is my example of it. So if it is 4 a.m., you're doing mental math games that's stimulating your head more. Okay, 6 a.m. is my rise time. It's 4 right now. I have two hours left to get to sleep. Oh my God, you know. We don't want that. That's the purpose of turning around the clock. This person turns around the clock sleeping beautifully. Sometimes people say just, you know, that alone can be helpful. So, a, a very, this is one I start with uh, often with therapy patients is keep the same rise time every day regardless how you sub. So on weekends, on weekdays, with patients I determine like what time do you have to be up for work and like how, what time do you have to be up to, to be there and be on time and how long will it take you to get ready. So if that's 6 a.m. I have to be there at 8 a.m. 6 a.m. is their kind of designated rise time. One second. Then they're going to be doing that on the weekends as well. And um, for this period of, you know, four weeks, eight weeks that they're working with me, I ask them to, to stick and see how it works for them. Stick to that same rise time. And then even if they had a bad night where they were getting up a couple times with the stimulus control and having to get out of bed or they didn't go to bed till one because they weren't sleepy, you're still getting up at that same time. So that serves two purposes. It's going to get your body, your biological rhythm depends on a rhythm. It wants it to be regular. By you... 
especially if you sleep in, we might give people later on like an hour difference to kind of be nice, but uh, really any hour you add, that's like an hour of jet lag. So if you're doing a few hours, that would be like you flying east to west coast every week if you, you know, your weekends are that much longer, and that's not good for the body. So, so really trying to keep it within that same time on weekends, and no matter how you feel, even if you had a bad night, because again, that's building that sleep debt of gonna have a better night the next night. So yeah, this day we'll count on is just gonna be crappy, and we know that and we expect that, and it's short term we're gonna get to better sleep, and then that sleep will be lasting quality. So, questions? What if you are um, traveling to another time zone? Do you keep the same rise time from your permanent time zone, or does it depend how long you're gonna be in that other time zone? How do you adjust? Yeah, that would be one I'd like to sit the person down and like talk with them to figure out exactly like how long because it because we do strategize based on that and I have a really nice article of like things you do before the flight during the flight after the flight so if you email me I can uh, talk to you further about that um, so yeah same rise time you want to be ideally raise, rising like this more likely we're gonna be looking like this in the morning and not feeling great but even if it's like that feet on the floor and getting up you know regular uh, breakfast is a good thing you know start this seems like a lot, but you know, like eating something to, to get going. Morning sun is awesome, it resets the circadian clock. So if you are feeling sleepy because the night went crappy, getting 20 minutes of outside unadulterated sun will do wonders. Exercise is fabulous for sleep too, for mood. It does a lot for a lot of things, so I, I often recommend that. When your alarm clock goes off, don't hit snooze 10 times. You're getting poor quality sleep there of kind of being in and out too, so really, at most once, but really just try to hit it and get up, um, not spending much time there. So here's the napping. So, um, so no, if you're feeling sleepy during the day, especially during this treatment, don't nap. Fight the urge, find other things to do, whether it's breathing, exercises, going for a walk, you know, talking to people, st stimulating yourself. Find the things that stimulate you and do them at that time, uh, especially during our treatment. So we, as a general rule, we say no napping, but as we age, or if you have pain, or different conditions are, are kind of, the way we get around it is try to do them earlier in the day. It will kind of map on to the night before rather than taking away from your hours of the following night you're gonna go to sleep, so you'll have a better chance you can fall asleep the next night. And then if you do that 20, 30 minute and set your phone or whatever for it, like that power nap, there's a lot of um, support of the power nap. Basically we go through five a night, five cycles of sleep, and it starts at a shallow, and it gets deep, and then it goes to REM, and then it'll start all over, and it does that five times. If you're doing a nap during the day, it'll do the same thing. It's taking a whole cycle. A whole cycle is 45 to 60 minutes, so if you sleep just 20 of that, you're gonna save yourself from losing your deep sleep. You only get so much deep sleep a night, too, and REM sleep, so you don't wanna rob into that, so that's why the point of 20, 30 minute naps is better for you. So earlier, shorter naps. I have Homer up here because I think he, um, the more um, snacks you have in the day kills your appetite. The more naps is similar to snacks. It's gonna kill your sleep appetite for that night. So if you can at all, avoid them. Even in advertent dozing, I had to brainstorm with someone why a part of the therapy wasn't working and we figured out five minutes before on the couch, he was like just, and it was shooting off, then he was having trouble falling asleep, so. Uh, let's see, just a couple more slides for you guys. Um, quieting the mind, so this is the stuff with the stress. Um, recommend, uh, there's a ton of uh, audio stuff on the internet of just breathing exercises, yoga exercise can be very helpful to really just relax you. Um, we call one a buffer zone, uh, and, and now there's more research on this, that you can't, most people try to doom, doom, doom their day, and then they try to go right to bed. Well, you can't do that. You really need a, a period of quiet time to adjust from heavy activity of the day to bed, to stillness. So you give yourself like 30 minutes to unwind, do relaxing things that are la relaxing, sleep promoting for yourself during this time, and just give that to yourself, and that can make a big difference in helping you to fall asleep quicker. The um, problems and solutions, this is for those people that had the lists and the worrying about other things. We actually have people schedule in worry time, 15 minutes a day, like trying to you know, find a time to do it. It can actually be either a 
true um, activity where you have like a side of worry and a side of solutions and you're kind of brainstorming. It could just be lists if that's most helpful for you, like I have this, this, this going on. By the fact that you're doing it during the day, you're taking it away from the bedtime so it's not arousing. You are giving yourself a plan and a time to do it. If it starts creeping in your head at night, you remind yourself, no, I have this time during the day to do it. So it seems kind of hokey a little bit, but for some people I say try it out because if you're the type of person that's worrying and has lists, give it a week or two and try this and do it daily, you know, 15 minutes away from bed. Um, I have to say that works. It works? It works if you schedule your worry time. It, it really, mm -hmm. it sounds crazy, it works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of these are kind of like, eh, but, but I treat everybody like you're your own person. Just try out, see what works. If it doesn't, bag it, you know, move on to other tips. So, so we give you a bunch. The final couple is just tweaking your bedroom environment. We want it dark, dark curtains. See, this bedroom has no other distractions. Looks very peaceful. So if you, this is an easy fix. You're not fixing your body at this point. So getting your... Um, Setting your room a little bit cooler, but layering blankets, it's easier to get yourself unhot by flipping off a blanket than it is going this and having to have the whole house switch. So start with the temperature, not too cold, but wherever you're comfortable with, and then layer blankets, because it's easier to take them off, especially during, if, if you're like peri or postmenopausal in that period. Comfy blankets, pillows, you know, dark room. They say change bedding and pillows every 10 years. I don't know, but, um, but just making it dark, quiet, cool as, as possible will be helpful for your sleep. And then the habit things that people talk about, sometimes the sleep hygiene, reducing caffeine. We say um, two cups no later than 2 o'clock, 12 ideally, but up to 2 is fine. Don't make them like super grande, strong, you know, like they should just be two regular cups. Um, while you're doing this. Uh, I, I, I like to think that coffee can be helpful to get people through the tiredness that they experience while they're kind of making these adjustments. Smoking's bad for you. I don't usually make people quit, but I would rather ask that they at least don't do it during hours of sleep or right before sleep, because um, I know that's another whole habit which could, could be hard to change. Eating, you don't want to eat too heavy or light meals before bed. A light snack could be good so you have something in your stomach and you're not waking up feeling hungry. Exercise, they say do it four to six hours before bed if possible, um, especially for yeah, women that are kind of perimenopausal. Um, that heat could be, what happens is our temperature drops significantly and that's a sign, a biological sign to fall asleep. So if it's too high, it's starting from a higher baseline. So exercising is great for sleep, great for mood, great for physical, all kinds of stuff. I highly encourage it, but just kind of time it right. Um, talked about coffee. Cigarettes, alcohol is not great. I, I tell people if they're gonna do it, do it with dinner, don't do it late. Don't do it as like a, a happy hour at 9, 10 p.m. It will in, interfere with your sleep. Usually how you'll see it interfere with your sleep is it wears off in the middle of the night and you'll have early morning awakenings. It's worn off and that's when you'll notice. So if you've ever had experience that, that's what's going on. So I recommend do it with dinner at an early hour, like five, six, and it won't interrupt your, your sleep, so. Okay, so, uh, so the, the books I wanted to tell you about. There's um, my mentor, Rachel Mamber, and this is Colleen Carney, wrote this book, Quiet Your Mind and Get to Sleep. It's a self-help book, so it's, I, I find it really helpful and recommend it to patients. If you feel you can do kind of self-help stuff yourself, it's really exactly what I would do in therapy, but in paper form, and it's got exercises in it. Quiet Your Mind and Get to Sleep. Down here it says solutions to insomnia for those with depression, anxiety, and chronic pain. Don't feel like if you don't meet those things that this book is wrong for you because it is a very general book. Um, it just touches on those things too. But um, So this is a really good resource. Who's the author again? Um, Colleen Carney, C-A-R-N-E-Y, and Rachel Manber, M-A-N-B-E-R. You can just... Um, Amazon, you know, just type them into Amazon, that book pops up. Yeah. Does taking melatonin help? Um, I have mixed feelings about melatonin. There's basically not enough efficacy studies to show that it makes a difference. But I think some people kind of push it. I don't know if it's placebo. It helps for certain things, for circadian rhythm. Yes, we use it clinically for that, but not really for insomnia, truly. So. 
at this time. Uh, apps available, this is a free one, CBTI Coach. It was created by the VA. I've found it can be hard to find, and what I love about this, it has the sleep diaries and everything I do and tools, but it's really, to me, it feels like it's uh, an adjunct to treatment, like if you were going in and having a therapist walk through with you. But you, you know, you can play around with it, it's free, and it's got all the tips on there. This one is a commercially available one, so it costs money and I have no idea how much. This one's called Sleepio. So they have a both internet delivered or you could do it phone by app. And the fully automated CBT online is, there's one called Shut Eye, one called Sleepio. These two, again, both charge money, but it's the full package, you're just doing it online. Or you can come to myself, I'm, I'm now, um, board certified in behavioral sleep medicine and um, accepting patients now. And so um, I have flyers up here with my contact information on the clinic that, that you can, if you want to go this way, if you still feel you didn't get enough. It's just considered like a, a specialist appointment, so whatever your copay would be for seeing a specialist. We're currently we're in the um, university hospital clinic on the third floor, but we're hoping soon to be coming here as well. So. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.